verse 2. Brother Shane, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Absolutely. Dear Lord, we come to you now in a moment of need, as we all have. And we ask, Lord, that you provide us with the health and the strength that would allow us to continue the work that you've paved for us to love you and love others. We ask that you bless this time together in fellowship. Bless the word as it's spoken. May it touch our hearts that we may radiate that word to the rest of the world. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
uh, we want to uh, uh, kind of like keep praying, right? The Lord has given us a ministry, and we need to learn from the Lord how to carry out that ministry. And the ministry of manhood is not, per se, better than the ministry of womanhood, but it is different than the ministry of womanhood. And so while my wife is doing the one, Lord willing, uh, me and a fellow named Rick Burgess are going to try to do the other, him by video and me in person. But uh, uh, we did meet this morning at 9 for prayer, and uh, that was uh, had a good crowd this morning. I was pleased with that. I'm sure the Lord was. Uh, just one special thing. We have a long list of sick people that we're praying for. Some of it's terminal, some of it's not. We're praying for the Bible. <laughs> But Miss Eileen, who is one of our members who works uh, in a civilian position, but with the uh, leadership uh, on one of our bases here, uh, asked us again to pray for her as she's under immense stress. That stress has put her in the ER once this year. Uh, she's not had to go back, but she said she could feel that coming on and ask us to continue to pray for her. And I know that we have actually three or four people in the church that have very stressful jobs. And so as we pray this morning, we've already prayed a couple of three times for uh, the preaching and the music, but we want to pray for um, these people and the stress that they face. And I think uh, given the various jobs that are represented, we should leave it very general and not try to give any details there. But I'm going to ask Brother Dan if he will lead us in prayer this morning. Uh, Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for getting us up this morning, Lord. Uh, giving us a uh, new spirit, a new life, Lord. Uh, thank you for giving us a uh, that we can come together as uh, brothers and sisters uh, uh, in your name, Lord, uh, uh, the works of uh, the works of your name, and uh, you are truly to be glorified, Lord, and uh, uh, we also thank you for giving us uh, your word, Lord, that uh, is, uh, is not changing, it's only this day and the next way a different way. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Uh, we pray that um, uh, the eyes and ears would be open to uh, the Holy Spirit's call, Lord. Uh, pray that uh, you give us faster, Lord, than that which delivers the message that's uh, been placed on his heart, Lord. And uh, um, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You know, I told Brother Dan we weren't going to do a missions moment this week, but then the Lord kind of convicted me this morning, and we're going to do a missions moment, but from a different perspective. Normally, we look and see what God's doing through other people, but I want to take just a second and refresh your mind what God's called you and me to do. In Acts 1, I think it's verse 14, it mentions the fact that the church there was gathered together in prayer. For about 10 days. Of course we know in Acts 2. They went forth and, and preached in the, in the streets. But let's back up then to Matthew. So or back up to Luke for a second. We're supposed to be prayed up. In Luke 24. It talks about that we should. Preach the gospel by preaching. Remission and re, uh, repentance. And remission of sins. So prayerful preaching. And it's not just because of the way we were raised, but the scripture says there in Acts 28, all power or authority is given unto Jesus, so we are to go forth. So we're prayerfully preaching on his power, his authority. And then John says that as the Father sent me, so send I you. So we look at sinners and often we get mad and we complain about sinners. But Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw them. So we should prayerfully preach in his power, his authority, with his passion, his love, in his power, his strength. Acts 1 8 says, You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. If you're born again this morning, the Holy Ghost has already come upon you. And we're supposed to preach that 
gospel message. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scripture. And he was seen to every person of every people in every place. So what I want you to do right now for our mission's moment is I want you to just close your eyes for just a second. And I want you to think of one of two things. One, with whom did I share the gospel this week? Or, with whom did I fail to share the gospel this week? And let the Lord direct you so that this next week, we can do that more effectively. Take me just a moment. Father, we do thank you for your spirit and how your spirit can convict us and guide us and encourage us, Lord. And I pray that he's done all of those things this morning, Lord, and help us to be the witness that you have us to be this week. And it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. <coughs> now, are we standing for this one or are we sitting and listening to y'all? Okay, everybody. Okay, so let's all stand. They introduced the song to us last week, and the three of them are going to play it and sing it. We're going to try to sing with them. Amen. He will hold me fast.
come forward. Right. Leave us in a word of prayer. Lord, Lord, and say that you Christ, I really glorify and really praise you. And, and that you are the love of God, the shepherd, lawyer, physician, the king of kings and lord of lords. And that uh, all you are is all together perfect. <coughs> and uh, that uh, we can give other freely thanks to you. Amen. You may be seated. some kind of 911 picture for me for a second while I'm making another announcement. I should have asked you that earlier. I apologize for my lack of planning. So before we talk about that, I'd like you to look around the room. Sometimes I am very uh, inobservant. It's funny, I observe certain things and wonder how in the world did my wife or daughter miss that? But then... We have all these new decorations around us. And there are some ladies who took their time. And, uh, I think, I'm not going to try to name who helped us. I'll get in trouble because I'll forget somebody. But the bulletin board in the uh, in the fellowship hall as well, where we'll be having the man church and the wow, um, that is, uh, that was done by the ladies. I think there's even some uh, flickerty lights on the one in the, in the, uh, Fellowship Hall, anyway, it, it does look nice, amen. I'm thankful that, I think I'm most thankful I didn't have to do it, amen. But uh, today marks 21 years since we, uh, since our country was attacked. I know not everybody in the country is a native of, of the United States, but I, uh, I'm sure all of us that are grown remember where we were. I don't know, I had a, a 24 foot beam on my shoulder, me and another preacher, I was helping them build a house before I went to a meeting the next day and it was, everybody on the job site was a Christian. We got the phone call from the brother's wife while we were holding uh, the beam and uh, when we got the beam set, we kind of all scattered out and uh, each had our own time with the Lord praying about uh, asking the Lord to, to turn our country back to Him. You know, the Bible says that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And that was true at one time for the United States. But when that, when that attack first happened on September the 11th, that's what today is, uh, of 2001, uh, it seemed like maybe there would be a revival. But I don't think there's a person in the house who would look at the United States or, or Europe for that matter and think that we are in a state of revival. Interesting to me that a, a gentleman this week from a third world country who follows 
a different God than we do, said that he was praying that those of us who were orthodox in our view would see the United States made great again. He wasn't even a Christian. I didn't realize that at first, but anyway, my point is, let's take a moment and remember the sacrifices have. Maybe you realize this and maybe you don't, but more people died on 911 than on June 6, 1945. We call it June 6, 1945 D-Day. We need to turn back to Christ. Let's just take a moment and talk with the Lord about these things and remember the sacrifices were made but the damn prayed thanking the Lord that we had a place to meet. Sacrifices were made so that we could have such a place. Let's just thank the Lord for a second for what he has done and ask him to do more. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our salvation. We thank you for the liberty that we have as citizens of the United States and other Western countries, Lord. We also thank you for the, the trouble that you allow in our lives to turn us back to thee, Lord. And I know life is... Israel of old and Judah of old, we don't seem to be listening to your prompts. And Lord, I ask that you give us ears to hear and hearts to heed the prompts to turn back to thee, Lord. At one time, our country was the home base for most of the missionaries of the world, Lord. And now, there are other countries who send missionaries to our country. Lord, turn our hearts back to thee. We pray these things in Christ's name. And for Christ's honor alone. We thank you for all those who have sacrificed, Lord, on that day to save lives and Lord, I, I saw where a young man who wasn't even alive in 2001 did a hundred and some odd flights of stairs in full fireman's gear to remember the sacrifice of the firemen from that day. And Lord, we don't want to forget those things, but we also don't want to forget the sacrifice that you made for us 2,000 years ago. We ask you again, in Christ's name, and for Christ's glory, that you turn our country back to thee. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We are in Matthew chapter 20 this morning. This is the 24th sermon that we have had in Matthew. We do have um, several... Uh, <coughs> Romanian speakers in the house. If it's not going to trouble uh, Damaris too badly, I'm going to ask her to read it in Romanian. Is that okay? Or are you occupied where you are? Okay. So I will read uh, uh, a verse or two, and then I'll let her read it so that Cosman and Turi and so forth can, can understand all of that. Or... The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. <clears throat> Thank you. 
And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour, and likewise, did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found uh, others standing idle, and said unto them, Why stand you here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He said, Then go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that ye shall receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. When they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made him equal unto us, which has borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered and said, he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that thine ears, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. It is is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first last, for many are called, but few are chosen. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her son. So this is James and John's mother. Worshipped him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these two my sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink 
of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they say unto him, We are able. He saith unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it shall be given them for whom it is prepared of my Father. But Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the way, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, what will ye that I shall do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Amen. All right, so a couple of things I want to point out, and then I'm going to pray, Lord willing, to preach. Um, verse 24, when these two disciples, okay, so the mother asked, right? The mom said, hey, can my two boys sit on your right hand and your left hand? But Jesus then seems to turn and speak to the two. So apparently he knew, because he knows everything, that they put mama up to this. All right? And then, if you look down here in verse 24, the ten brothers were mad at them. That's, that's not the exact words of Scripture. Mad in Scripture means crazy. Uh, they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. So the others are looking at them going, well, who do you think you are? Why are you asking to sit on his right and left? And that's how we, as Christians, will do sometimes is, is uh, we, we see the problem in the in the other people more than we see it in ourselves. But sometimes there is a greater problem with somebody else than ourselves. But, see, the division that arose because of the... Uh, the desires of James and John or the sons of thunder. One more thing I want to point out. Verse 16. So the last shall be first and the first shall be last for many are called but few are chosen. Many are called. There's a couple different things that we can say about this verse. Was Jesus raised up on high as in crucified? Yes or no? Was Jesus crucified? Okay, he was crucified. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw how many men? All men. All men. So everybody is called. Those of 
us who listen to that call are chosen. And yet, Jeremy, there's another application to this very these very words. And, and I'm going to say only the Lord knows which one is primary, but both of them are very true. Lots of people, now we know more people choose hell than choose Christ, but many people choose Christ. But not all those people choose to be close and choose for him to pour himself into their lives. I think that is a valid application as well. As many of us are called to salvation and we accept that call to salvation, but then, well, we kind of get, my dad called it the three S crowd, saved, sit down, and satisfied, rather than saved, separated, and serving, okay? And so it's that few there. There's two different things there. This, this parable and these events that, that follow it grew out of last week's encounter with the rich, rich young ruler, okay? Uh, if you look at, in chapter 19 and verse 30, Jesus says, Many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And then he closes out this parable with the same statement. So let's look at the, the setting here of the parable of the vineyard. That's the, the, that's the first point. The, the rich young ruler, what did we learn about him last week? What did he refuse to do? Come on. What did he refuse to do? What? He refused to give up his possessions and follow after Christ. Now, Christ is not teaching that riches are wrong. But Christ does give a stern <clears throat> warning to his disciples about riches. Then Peter brags about the fact, well, hey. We left everything to follow you. What are we going to get? All right? If you think about it, and hopefully I mentioned it last week, but that reveals a wrong motive. His question, I can't look into his heart, right? Uh, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1 tells me not to judge someone's motive. But it seems to indicate that he was serving for what? For reward for himself. That's right. Why should we serve Christ? Come on, wake up. Why should we serve Christ? To honor him. Because we love to honor him. Because we love him. Because we love him. Being thankful. Why do we love him? Because he loves us. Because he first loved us. That's exactly right. What did you say? Million thanks. So being, being thankful. Million thanks for. Uh, his what he did for us. A million thanks for all he did for us. That's exactly right. We serve him out of love and loyalty and gratitude. All right. Christ warns here that the first shall be last, first in the eyes of men, and the last at the judgment seat of Christ. All right. Some men, some whom, help me, Lord. This I, I wrote this sentence in a in a confusing way. So I'm going to try to reword it rather than give you what I have on the paper. Some people that we that we respect, even some people that Christians respect, at the judgment seat of Christ, maybe last. Okay. What's the significance of the parable? So this is kind of a lesson for us. We shouldn't try to make every aspect of any parable a teaching of itself. Don't take every part of a parable and try to make it mean something. Parables almost always have only one thrust or one main idea. And the main truth here is that God has the right to deal with his servants the way he chooses to deal with his servants. And that he has no need to defend himself to me or you as to why this guy preaches the same thing I do and Hey, he gets to preach. He doesn't have to work a secular job. Oh, he, he just gets to preach. Amen. That's none of my stinking business. My business is to be faithful to what I've been called to do. The parable is not about salvation. Now, I have heard, I have actually heard some, some southern gospel songs that try to make this about salvation. It's not about salvation. How do we know it's not about salvation? Well, we know it's not about salvation because we study the scriptures, Lord willing. 
The Bible says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that the, the faith is not of yourself. It's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, it's not by works of righteousness we have done, righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, Amen. by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Romans 3, 19 and 20. We know that whatsoever things the law saith, it said to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, but by the law is the knowledge of sin. Christ is not even necessarily talking about the rewards for service here. God will reward his own differently according to their service. First Corinthians chapter 3 talks about he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. John 4, 36. He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. If the word penny stood for rewards, that would make God sort of communistic, right? Because everybody got the same reward. Can you imagine little old me expecting to get the same rewards of the Apostle Paul? Man, I'm not even worthy to, to, to be on the same planet with the man, let alone expect to get the same reward. If you connect 20 and verse 10, but when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. With 1927, which is Peter's questions, we left everything. What are we going to get? We see Peter seems to be thinking of himself, as were the workers. The workers who came at six versus the workers who came at five. The ones who came at six, even though they had a contract, seemed to think they should get more. Christ teaches again that we have he has the right to do with his service what he will. And that to have wrong motives, verse 15 uses the term, if thine eye be evil or sinful. But notice this. The ones that came at six, they had to have a contract. The ones that came at five, he just told them, hey, you go and, and I'll do what's right by you. Look at the servant. Raise your hand. No, don't. I won't ask you to do that. Say amen if you're born again. Amen. amen. Well, that's about half the crowd. Amen. <laughs> Isn't it sad today that many Christians are standing idle when clearly so much needs to be done? This parable reminds us that we should serve Christ out of love and loyalty and not simply for rewards. It's, it's, it isn't sinful to earn a reward. But God in his grace rewards the faithful. First Corinthians chapter 3. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man... Build upon this foundation, upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. If you're born again, if you said amen and you know that you're born again, you're going to build with all of those things. You're going to do some things the right way with the right attitude and for the right reason. And sometimes you're going to do the right thing the wrong way and with the wrong attitude. That's wood, hay, and stubble. The right thing, the right way, the right attitude, that's gold, silver, and precious stones. Listen to this. Every man's work shall be manifest, shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. A couple of different things. A lot of people today preach that there's only one final judgment. You cannot preach that and truly understand all the scriptures because the scripture teaches that this judgment 
everybody's going to be saved. Therefore, we preach, as many who have gone before us, that there is a judgment seat of Christ for believers who are raptured out, and there is a great white throne for unbelievers at the end times. Everybody at the judgment seat of Christ will be saved. Amen. The people in the end times will not be saved. But, What's being taught by this? You can get a reward. You're going to get a reward. He is faithful. But you and I, in today's time, should strive to be filled with the rewarder or price rather than with concerns about the rewards. We have to watch our motives. The right work done the right way. Excuse me. The, well, I just said it a second ago. The right work done with the wrong motive actually dishonors God, and it robs us of a blessing. It's a sobering thought to think that it is entirely possible that some Christians we admire and even idolize may be last at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? Matthew 7, 1, it clearly teaches that we should not judge someone else's motives. And it also teaches that when we're hard on other people, they're going to be hard on us. With what judgment you judge? You shall be judged, but what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. All right? So what are we supposed to do? I'm going to let you take a stab at that. What are we supposed to do? If, if I'm not supposed to judge Phil, and I'm not supposed to judge Jeremy, what am I supposed to do? We're supposed to judge ourselves. According to the word of God. Well, both of those are true. I wasn't really looking for that, but I'll give you an amen on that one. Amen. Come alongside of and help. All right? But I'm supposed to judge my own heart. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. In 1 Peter chapter 4, the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. God's going to reward you. If you're saved, and if you're saved, you're going to be in heaven. If you're saved, you're going to have that eternal reward, that eternal bliss, that eternal worship, that, etern that eternal camaraderie. The 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 you are joint heirs with Jesus. Joe's prayer came to me when he was praying a while ago. Joe's prayers are like a little theological education. If you pay attention to what he said, because he used various names of Christ from Scripture. And all those things are true. If you and I know the scripture, then we know that we will be with heaven, with Christ in heaven if we're saved. We are joint heirs with Jesus. That means he's not only my savior, he's my brother. Isn't that, that God made you a brother with Jesus Christ? I would say raise your hand and if, if, if you see yourself as worthy of that, but some idiot might raise their hand, so I'm not going to ask that question. None of us are worthy of that. I am worthy of that only because Christ made me so. Amen. The, the parable here is we have got to be concerned with Christ more than what reward are we going to get for serving Christ. Okay? Verses 17 to 28. The prayer for glory. So verses 17 to 19, Jesus tells them again, this is the third time, I call it the third news release here, that Christ announces to his disciples for the third time, hey, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to die, but I'm going to get up on the third day. In Matthew 16, uh, 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of the men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. Christ in his grace, and then he's given them the third one. Let me give you the one here that we just read. <clears throat> Behold, we go to Jerusalem, the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the chief priests, and to the, unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. You notice each time he made the announcement, he gave us a little bit more. 
He's not only going to be mistreated by the scribes and the Pharisees, he's going to be mistreated by the Gentiles, but the good news is he's going to get up on that third day. Amen? Then we get to the request. Zebedee's wife, John and James's mama, asked him something. Yeah, remember we, we talked about it. We can find a reason to admire somebody. Did she ask a question that was inappropriate? She did. But look at the faith in which she asked it. She, she, she had faith in Christ. She believed there was a kingdom coming. The motive to have her sons on the right and left? Well, that wasn't exactly right. But she still had great faith there. Okay? Look at his reply. He turns and speaks to the disciples and not to mama. Okay? Uh, suggesting that he knew they pushed her to ask the question. Now, <clears throat> they were ignorant of what the Lord meant by cup and baptism, both of which pointed to his sufferings. We can see that in Luke 12. I have a baptism to be baptized with. Jesus promised that they would indeed taste the cup and the baptism. James was the first disciple martyr, Acts chapter 12. John suffered greatly. You know, he was, he was exiled to the to the Isle of Patmos. We have to be careful what we pray for and how we answer the Lord. I thought of this this morning as I was thinking through the sermon. Garth Brooks used to have a song, Unanswered Prayer. I hate the name of that song because no prayer is unanswered. Maybe you didn't get the answer you were looking for. But you think for a moment right now Maybe even the children, but definitely those of us who are grown. How many things, how many people, how many situations, how many jobs have we prayed for that didn't come to pass? And we're unthankful. Or, let's think about it this way. I'm going to be real careful, hopefully, in how I word this. How many things or situations or whatever have you prayed for that you are thankful it didn't come to pass because you could not imagine trading what the Lord gave you in place of that request for what you were previously requesting? Hmm? Amen. He's a good God. We do need to be careful what we pray for. Listen to this. And this is from Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. And be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. What is the sacrifice of fools? Many words. This is the sacrifice of fools. Have you ever noticed people that give you, it's, okay, so I'm fat, everybody in the room knows it. Can I just tell you the most annoying thing to me is for somebody that has never, ever been overweight a moment in their life to tell me how to lose weight? God has given them a different metabolism than he's given them. Do I need to lose weight? Absolutely, 100%. I've lost a whopping two pounds in two weeks, all right? But sometimes we we are very foolish because we give advice about things. If Garrett tries to tell me how to lose weight, he ain't got a clue. <laughs> and sometimes we come to the house of God and we give marital advice when we're not even married. We give marital advice when we've been divorced 14 times. We give, you know what I'm saying? We we give our we give the sacrifice of fools. If you want to give somebody advice. You better be sure you've got a chapter and a verse to back it up. Don't give your stinking opinion. Because opinions are like armpits. Everybody's got them and most of them stink. Back to the text at hand. Be not rash with thy mouth. Let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God's in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of busyness. 
Okay, so let me read the rest of the verse, and then I'm going to take a second to explain that. A fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. That's the sacrifice of fools, the multitude of words. A dream coming through a multitude of busyness. I tried to pronounce that a little differently because when we think of business today, what do we think of? Don't everybody jump at one time like that. It overwhelms me. Well, when I, I think of a business today, I think of Saturn. I think of I think of Penny. I think of Cowlock, right? Mm -hmm. That's not what he's talking about. The root word of business is what? Busy. Busy. In other words, we have a dream. I have a dream, to see. I want to hear the Lord say to me at the judgment seat of Christ, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. That comes to pass not by listening to what some idiot has to say, but by daily working so that I can hear him say that because I've done what he's asked me to do. A dream comes to pass through through working, through busyness, not through idling. Stop saying I wish and start saying I will, right? That's the general idea here. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer thy mouth. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error, wherefore God should be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands. We, we need to be careful with what we ask for before God. And if we ask for something good, remember what the Bible says in 12.03. I'm not going to be down by 12. It's newsflash. <laughs> remember what the, uh, what the, uh, the Lord said in uh, Philippians chapter 2? It's God that worked in you both the will and to do his good pleasure. So if I want something good, it's because God put that in there. He also gave me the ability to do what it takes to bring it to pass. If God gave me the desire, he will give me the doing of it. Busyness, not just words. Okay? What's the result? James chapter 3 says, Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindled. This, this, Apparent selfishness on the part of James and John made the other ten angry. Selfishness on the part of any one believer can cause problems in the life of the entire church. Jesus used this opportunity to teach the disciples a lesson on humility. The great person in the crowd is the one who serves others. Christ himself is the purest example. Oops. One too many pages, amen. To exercise lordship as the people of the world would do is completely foreign to the Christian life. Christian leaders are to shepherd the flock, with to guide the flock, with to direct the flock, but I'm never to, to, go, to govern in pride or self-will but humbly as an under-shepherd who's following the chief shepherd and bishop of our souls, Amen. which is Christ. All right? The performance of a miracle, 29 to 34, talking about, if we read this in Mark, it's blind Bartimaeus. Here, there are two, okay? It's like... It's more than likely the fact that Bartimaeus was more well-known, more verbal than the, the other two, but uh, than the other one. But the miracle here is the picture of salvation. They were blind. We talked about it in Sunday school. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them in whom the God of this world, Satan, hath blinded their minds. All right? They were poor beggars, just like the lost sinner from Luke chapter 7. They cried out to Jesus, who alone can open men's eyes. He showed them mercy. They were not healed by praying through. They weren't healed by crying out. They were healed by the wonderful, matchless grace 
of Jesus. The crowd tried to stop them. Sinners have tried to keep people from coming to Christ today. Things haven't changed. The matchless, the magnanimous grace of Jesus touched their lives. How do we know that? Two things. They began to see and they followed Christ. They began to see and they followed Christ. I don't recall who it was, but someone, I believe it was Joe. Someone recently said to me, before I was saved, reading the scripture was like reading gobbledygook. I didn't really understand uh -huh. anything I read. Uh -huh. But once I got saved, it's like it just opened up. It came alive to me. Well, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians that the things of God, the scriptures, are not... They're spiritually discerned. You have to have the spirit. The fact that these men, we see 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that they were blind, now they see. They weren't following Christ, now they are following Christ. So we've seen the parable, we have seen the prayer, and we have seen the performance of a miracle. Well, what do we need to do? Michelle's fixing to come to the piano. All my notes for the sermon, they're done. Anything else is, is just in an effort to see you apply it to your heart. Help me. Point one would be introspection. Looking at myself. Am I more concerned with pleasing my Savior or being better than my fellow saints? Point two, the prayer. What is my motive for service? I've been called. Am I, am I putting myself in such a place that Christ can and will pour himself into me? Point three, can the world around me see 2 Corinthians 5.17 in my life? Can they see that I once was blind, but now I see I was also following Christ, but now I am. Each of you will have to talk to the Lord and have Him and His Spirit help you with the answer to that. But this one promise I can give you. If in any of those things, those areas, you see something that needs to change, He said if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He'll not only clean us up and put us back on the path, but he'll take away even the guilty conscience for where we fail him. If we let him. If you're here this morning and you have no idea because you're still trying to work this out for yourself, then let me or one of these dear brothers and sisters take a Bible and show you how you can know that you're saved. You don't need to hope so. With no arrogance in my heart and complete humility, I can say to you today, I know that my sins are forgiven. I know that I have a home in heaven. Because I'm in Christ's name. No man can close me out. Don't you want to be able to fill your head tonight with that security that you know you're born again, you know you have Thank you.
stand. And for our dismissal prayer, we will sing, Set My Soul Afire. We'll sing all three verses that I have misplaced. Uh, that's not it. Give me a second. It's in here someplace. Ta-da. There it is. 